Chang'e, I'm a PhD student in the Rice Lab at UC Berkeley. So today I'm going to discuss different ways to use machine learning to uh, estimate cardinality, uh, specifically learning from queries versus learning from data. So in the past couple of years, I worked on two projects on um, using ML to learn cardinality. And interestingly, despite the same goal, uh, the approaches are pretty different. So today I'm going to first introduce the key ideas behind both projects and then briefly discuss the differences. So let's look at the first piece of work. So the work happened two years ago when I interned at Microsoft. Um, it's called Card Learner, towards a learning optimizer for shared cloud. So the key here is the word shared cloud, right, which refers to a setting where thousands of users are sharing the cloud computing resource to execute queries. And because of the sharing, we notice that the same type of query subgraphs will appear over and over again. So the idea here is, can we learn from previously executed query subgraphs to uh, optimize for future subgraphs? So there are three key aspects that I want to discuss. Uh, first of all, what is our granularity of learning? And then what features do we consider? And finally, what models we studied and how they perform? So by granularity of learning, I mean which part of the query subgraph is considered fixed when we train a model. So there are in general three pieces that form a subgraph. So first of all, we have the logical expression of the query subgraph, and then we have its parameter values. So think about uh, filtering and joining predicate values. And lastly, we have the input data set. So one extreme is we can fix everything. That basically means memorization. Right? We will basically cache the output cardinality of all subgraphs executed so far. And if for future subgraphs, um, if it uh, matches exactly as one of the existing ones, we'll basically use the cache cardinality. So the advantage is that it has 100% accuracy, of course, because there is just memorization, no learning going on. But it has low applicability because we simply can't do anything for non-exact match subgraphs. And another extreme is when nothing is fixed. So this implies that we'll train a single model that can accept any subgraph and predicts the uh, output cardinality. So the benefit is that it will lead to 100% applicability. But in practice, we found that it's pretty challenging to construct such a model because it's somewhat uh, difficult to encode this variable length query DAG into a fixed length feature vector while preserving this DAG's structural information. And also because the resulting model is, uh, is pretty challenging, uh, the overhead of feature extraction and parameter tuning becomes uh, pretty significant. So in the paper, we basically take the middle ground. Uh, we learn a model per each subgraph template where we require the logical expression to be fixed, but we allow the parameter values and the input data to change. So it's much easier to construct such a model because we're no longer required to featureize logical expression. And as we show in the paper, the resulting uh, accuracy and applicability are uh, both pretty high. And when we featureize each subgraph, this is a list of features we considered. Uh, first of all, it's very intuitive to include the uh, input cardinality as feature because in most cases, it will have a direct impact on the output cardinality. And to model a nonlinear relationship between the input and output cardinality, we also include some other uh, mathematical transformations, including the square, square root, and logarithm of uh, input cardinality as features. So that's uh, the input cardinality portion. And then the parameters of the subgraphs also matters. For, for example, the filtering and joining predicate values, uh, they also matter. And lastly, we have some metadata that's important as well. So think about uh, the name and normalized name of each job in the input query and data set. Because these metadata can sometimes be used as arguments to user-defined functions. So it's important to capture them as well. And after featureization, the next, ne next question is uh, what type of model do we use? Right? So we studied three families of uh, models, including linear regression and Poisson regression, uh, which is a widely used model to uh, model count-based data, and finally neural net. So we performed a bunch of uh, benchmarks, but this is sort of a killer experiment. So over a uh, thousand of uh, query subgraphs, we plotted the cumulative distribution of the ratio between the estimated cardinality and the true cardinality for all query subgraphs. And you can see that with our models, the distribution is almost like a step function at value one, which means that in uh, most cases, the learned cardinality is very close to the actual cardinality. 
So this is a very high level overview of uh, learning from queries. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, there is also a research talk on Wednesday about this project. So in contrast to the first work, um, the second piece of work called Naru uh, learns only from the data itself and not from the queries. And also in this work, we're trying to answer a much more specific type of queries, which is how many rows does a filtering query return? So let's consider this very simple query, right? I want to st uh, select star from the table below where age less equal to 25 and salary less equal to 2,000. And also here, let's define the density of each unique tuple as the frequency of that tuple divided by the total number of tuples in the table. So in this table, for example, the tuple 24,000 has a density of 2 over 4 because it appeared twice out of uh, four total number of tuples. So the key insight here is that selectivity of filtering queries is nothing more than an integration of valid tuples. So in this case, we have our valid age being 24 and 25, valid salary being 2,000. So integrating over the joint density gives us the total selectivity of 0 0.75. So our goal here now is to learn the density of each tuple. So the families of models we consider is called deep likelihood models. So our training phase involves uh, streaming every tuple into the deep likelihood model, and we use the uh, unsupervised loss function to train our model, and specifically we use the maximum likelihood loss. And the model will then produce a set of conditional probability distributions, and these probabilities multiplied together will give us the selectivity of each given tuple. So during the inference phase, for equality query, it's actually very simple. We just feed a vector of filtering predicate values to the model, and we perform one forward pass, multiply the conditional probabilities together to get the selectivity. But for range queries, things become much more challenging because we need to integrate over all possible regions covered by our filtering predicates, which is exponential. So our solution is to use sampling, but the problem is if we just use a naive uh, uniform sampling, we see that although it's an unbiased estimator, uh, from the left figure, we can see that the variance is very high because it's ignoring the conditional probability distribution while sampling. So a better alternative is called progressive sampling, which takes into account the joint distribution when we choose which region to sample. So on the right figure here, we see that the points being sampled are in general much more in, uh, informative and has much less variance. And at the end, we'll perform some uh, importance weighting to make sure that the estimator is still unbiased. So basically, with progressive sampling, uh, we can achieve the same accuracy with far fewer numbers of samples due to low variance. So a uh, snippet of the performance result for NARU. Uh, we can see that NARU can outperform a Postgres uh, optimizer, for example, by up to 10,000 times in terms of estimation accuracy, and a commercial uh, DBMS by up to 230 times. And we also evaluated against some uh, state-of-the-art supervised learning method and showed that NARU can outperform them as well. So finally, I want to summarize how these approaches are different and make some comparisons. So the models used by Cartner are supervised regression models. We use the query's true output carnality as label, and we use the L2 loss function to fit the regression curve. And the advantage of Cartner is that it can be applied to any types of queries, as long as you can featureize your query and you can get the true output carnality as your label. And actually, when you have enough training queries, the performance is great. And NARU, on the other hand, um, uses a generative approach to approximating the joint distribution. So the approach is unsupervised, so there's no label. And although NARU is currently confined to uh, single table filtering queries, it actually achieves great performance. And importantly, it works for any uh, filter queries on that table uh, without uh, requiring any training queries. And if you think about data stores like Document Store, like JSON Store, and NoSQL Store, a uh, single table filtering query is uh, it's actually a pretty common workload. Uh, okay, that's uh, pretty much all I have. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Yeah, the queries uh, for the 
for the narrow one, uh, it's currently under revision for next year's BLDB. I don't believe we evaluated the end-to-end -end performance for narrow. For car learner, uh, we does evaluate the end-to-end -end, uh, latency for, uh, for a number of production workload at Microsoft. And uh, best case, achieves 2x latency boost. But uh, uh, in some case, it, it, uh, it can uh, get a little bit slower due to uh, some uh, misprediction of our model. So although like, so previously Microsoft optimizer was like the scope optimizer was like heavily overestimating the cardinality by like a million times, we were able to reduce that to like, uh, like uh, 5x, uh, stuff like that. But the end-to-end -end latency result is not that impressive because sometimes uh, uh, although you uh, improve the uh, estimation accuracy, that doesn't necessarily lead to a plan change. Yeah. Second, for the MSCN numbers that you have, why are they so much higher than what are reported in the MSCN paper? The, yeah, that one, I think I have to look it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have data on top of that. Sorry, have you taken it offline? Yeah. So, oh, okay, so your problem is much better than MSCN. Right? Um, so, I remember this is on the DMV, yeah, a data set called DMV or something, right? or Conviva, yeah, whichever. Uh, how would you compare with some uh, AQP methods for, for data encoding? Because if okay. I'm understanding correctly, they also apply some progressive sampling strategies. For AQP being uh, approximate? Approximate progressive uh, for, for the narrow the progressive sampling. Uh, to my knowledge, we haven't uh, compared to AQP yet, but uh, it would definitely be interesting to investigate on that direction. Um, and I think that there are some works about um, using the model to um, estimate the cardinality right height. And I think actually your, uh, your method is a little bit similar to the graph model, so on the show. Yeah, have you ever measured that? Yeah, there are a bunch of, there are definitely like, it's basically, I have a, I can replace the, the heuristic based learning to a model, and there are definitely lots of alternatives we can try. And actually, I think during the ULD re re revision, the request that we got is basically you, you guys need to evaluate it against like five or six more alternatives, actually, including some traditional methods like histogram. And I actually implemented the, the most state of the art histogram. It's called like max diff histogram with like uniform spread assumption and stuff. And it, it, it's, uh, it actually performs fine, um, but not as good as, uh, as narrow. I think the core reason is because for histograms, uh, they're basically the decision making boundary is a linear cut, whereas the, you know, these kind of models is like an arbitrary mathematical <laughs> transformation. So it's more flexible and more expressive. That's my thought on this. Thanks. Can you comment about the estimation time required by the data approach versus value approach? The estimation over the inference time. The inference time, yeah. So for for card learner, the estimation time, the, the added overhead is almost nothing. Because in that case, the models we use are very simple, like linear model or very uh, pretty uh, shallow neural network. So, and, the, and, and all the features, feature extraction phase already perform, is already performed as existing process on their like uh, tree extractor on the Microsoft scope. So the additional overhead is pretty minimal. For, for NARU, we haven't uh, tried it on production system yet, but for NARU, we've actually been using GPU during the inference phase. And uh, I think to my knowledge, it's, uh, it's definitely slower than hardware, but the added overhead is not that simple. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so actually, I have tons of questions for you, but uh, I, I think we're going to do time limit. I, I don't think. Well, I think everybody wants to go for lunch, uh, go for dinner. So, probably we can. And and I, I'm not sure whether you can, really can convince me that we the never can um, better than MSC because we're the MSC also is there. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, I I think it definitely depends on workload. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah cool. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I, I actually <laughs> also don't believe that narrow will outperform in any case. Uh, yeah, 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 actually, <laughs> actually uh, I also doubt whether, whether, because we, um, 
Nero is uh, more like an unstructured lesson learning mechanism, yeah. and I'm not sure whether you can scale to multiple costs, but I, I know that yeah, yeah. yeah. Multiple yeah, there are task consequences. Join queries. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, 